Welcome everyone to a new Lanterna Biology video brought to you by me, Marcus, and today is our last time talking about metabolic pathways, promised. So we covered cellular respiration, which is very, very central to understanding how we, you know, transfer energy within cells, within organisms. We've covered that in the last two videos, so please go back and watch those two if you haven't done so already. And today I'll be talking quickly about anaerobic respiration, so that is a way of producing ATP, so the sort of energy currency of the cell, when there is no oxygen present. But then we'll also go into photosynthesis, which is of course another central metabolic pathway, this time anabolic, so creating something instead of catabolic, breaking something down. And we'll see how that is very, very similar actually to cellular respiration, so we can use a lot of the concepts and molecules that we saw earlier again, so make sure you've already seen the other two videos. Otherwise, we'll be starting right away with anaerobic cellular respiration. So when we talked about cellular respiration, we only covered aerobic cellular respiration, which, which takes place in the presence of oxygen. So in order for that to take place, we used, as we saw, oxygen as the last electron acceptor in the electron transport chain at the very end. But if oxygen is not present, we can't use the electron transport chain. But that is where we get the most ATP, right? But if you remember, we also had a net gain of two ATP, we put in two, we get out four in glycolysis, which is of course the first step of cellular respiration. And now if there's no oxygen present and the electron transport chain can't work, we can run glycolysis over and over again to still be able to create a small yield of ATP. So how does that work? Well, in glycolysis, we reduce our electron carrier NAD plus into NADH. And so for glycolysis to take place again and again, we need more oxidized NAD+, which we can then reduce again into NADH. So in order for that to take place, we need the end product of glycolysis, which is two molecules of pyruvate. We need to sort of repurpose them. And the way that we do that is that we use them as an oxidizing agent. So we reduce them and then we oxidize the NADH. That means that we get NAD plus out of it again. So we can just do glycolysis again and again and again. But of course, that also leaves us with another end product because we converted the two pyruvate into either ethanol in plants or lactic acid in animals and humans. And there are two important examples of this, which you know, one of them is fermentation. So both processes are actually called fermentation, but you might know fermentation from, you know, making beer or making the dough for bread, for sourdough bread. That is where the plant part of creating ethanol and carbon dioxide is happening. But then you also know the lactic acid fermentation from your own muscles. If you do a high intensity sport, physical activity, whatever, then you know that your muscles are going to get sore. And part of that is because of the lactic acid buildup. Because if you're exercising, you know, at high intensity, then there will not be enough oxygen readily available in the muscle cells meaning that your muscle cells will actually go into anaerobic respiration, creating lactic acid in the process. Now let's talk about photosynthesis. And as I said before, photosynthesis is essentially the complete opposite of everything that we saw in cellular respiration, in aerobic cellular respiration. So when in cellular respiration, we take in an organic compound like glucose, we also take in oxygen, and then we create ATP, and we give off carbon dioxide and water as byproducts. In photosynthesis, we have the opposite. So we take in a form of energy, which is light energy, so energy from the sunlight. And then we also take in carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and we take in water. And what we create is an organic compound and oxygen as a byproduct. So it's literally, if you look at the chemistry, the reverse. And now we'll also see how the biochemical processes involved are very similar as well. Before we get into the actual process, let's look at where this is taking place. So what do we need for photosynthesis in terms of organelles? So obviously photosynthesis takes place in plant cells. So usually in the leaves of the plants. There's a specific organelle, which we haven't talked about before, which is called the chloroplast. Chloroplasts are very similar to the mitochondria in animal cells, 
obviously plant cells have them too to create ATP, in that they have a double membrane. However, in the chloroplast, it looks a little different. So what we have there are so-called thylakoids. They're small membrane-bound sacs. And so these thylakoids are where photosynthesis specifically is taking place because just as for cell respiration, we need a membrane and we'll see why later. So if you look at a chloroplast, you have the stroma, which is the fluid-filled inner part. You have the thylakoids. They're stacked in what's called a granum or multiple grana. That's like a stack of, I always have the like this image of a thylakoid is like a pancake and then a granum is like a stack of pancakes and then multiple grana are like multiple stacks of pancakes and then inside each thylakoid you have this thylakoid lumen which lumen by the way is a good word to learn in biology lumen is anytime you have something that is bound by a membrane that can be like an artery or a vein or any sort of tube really and the inside then is the lumen okay and then you also have the inner membrane of the entire chloroplast, an intermembrane space, just as we saw as well for the mitochondria, and then an outer membrane. And that is where all of this is gonna take place. So I might refer to like individual parts of that when I tell you which chemical process is happening. So the first step happens in our thylakoids. And what happens here is, you know, the most central part because this is where it all starts, this is where we get our first energy input. So what happens is that in a process called photoactivation, we excite electrons. So what does that really mean? We'll get into the details of all of these reactions again in a later part because you only need that if you're HL. For SL, it's enough to have like a basic understanding of what's happening. So just hang on a bit for that later. So for SL and HO students as well, what happens here? Well, excited electrons are electrons in a high energy state. So these are the electrons that we can put into an electron transport chain, just as we did in cellular respiration. And so we use energy from the sun to do so, to excite the electrons. The way that we do that is with a photopigment, which is called chlorophyll. Chlorophyll gives plants the green color in the leaves and also the stem and you know pretty much everywhere. Chlorophyll is green because it doesn't absorb green light. If you have something and an object is a certain color, it will reflect that color and absorb other wavelengths of visible light. What the chlorophyll absorbs most strongly is blue and red light, so that's the sort of the wavelength of the light and it reflects green light. The light that it absorbs, we can then use to excite electrons. We will then send down the electrons in electron transport chain. And for the electron transport chain, you know where this is heading. It's heading to ATP synthase, so phosphorylation. And in order for that to take place, we need a gradient of protons, so hydrogen molecules. We actually use the light energy not only to excite the electrons, but also to split apart H2O, so water molecules, and we split them into O2, so atmospheric oxygen, which is given off as a byproduct, and into hydrogen molecules. And these we can use to create a proton motive force for chemiosmosis to take place, that is using the molecule ATP synthase that carry a protein to create ATP. Because even though our end goal is not to create ATP here, right, we want to create an organic molecule that we can then use in cellular respiration to create ATP. But think about, you know, where this all started. If you're a plant and you want an organic compound, in order to create that through carbon fixation, taking carbon, creating a molecule, an organic molecule, you still need ATP to begin with to start that entire process. So again, our first step here, the light dependent reactions, includes excitement of electrons, splitting of water, which is called photolysis, chemiosmosis, and the ATP production that is associated with it. And we are also going to reduce NADP. So that's an electron carrier that we're going to use here, which is different from the one that we use in cell respiration, which is just NAD+. And we're going to reduce NADP into NADPH. And then once that is over, which is really the more complicated part, then we go into the light independent reactions, which take place in the stroma. So just sort of inside of the chloroplast, but not inside of the thylakoid, which is where the stuff before happened, because we need a membrane for that, for the electron transport chain and chemiosmosis. 
for the light independent reactions, we have a cycle. So again, it's very sort of an analogy to cell respiration where we have the Krebs cycle. But here it's called the Calvin cycle. And in the Calvin cycle, we're going to use the hydrogen atoms that we have on the NADPH, right? We reduced NADP plus, we have NADPH, and we're gonna use these hydrogen atoms. We're gonna use CO2, so atmospheric carbon dioxide. And in a process which is called carbon fixation, we're gonna take that C, that carbon out of the CO2, combine it with the hydrogen from NADPH and with the help of ATP, which gives us the energy to do it. In that cycle, we're going to create glucose. So we are creating an organic compound, which is again, our end goal here. That's what we're trying to achieve. Again, if you're HL, that is not quite enough. We're going to look at more of the molecules and what happens on a biochemical level, but that is enough to have like a general idea of what's going on, right? And what kind of processes we're looking at. Broadly speaking, light dependent and light independent reactions, a lot of analogous parts to cellular respiration. And we're going to discuss now some of the broader features of photosynthesis. So that is like the limiting factors and what's important. And then we're going to jump into the details, the biochemical processes, which if you're SL are not very central, but just maybe have a look to solidify some of the knowledge that we just went over. So as you saw, photosynthesis depends on a range of factors and specifically a range of compounds that we absolutely need to have present. There are three factors that we call limiting factors. So if they are not present to a certain amount, the rate of photosynthesis will go down or remain stagnant. We're going to look at temperature, light intensity, and the concentration of CO2 as limiting factors and what their influence is on photosynthesis. As we will see in the detailed discussion of the biochemical reactions, there are a lot of enzymes which help us carry out photosynthesis. Again, enzymes are sort of the catalysts of these biochemical processes. And all of these enzymes are very, very sensitive to temperature fluctuations. If temperature increases, first of all, that is our first step, then the kinetic energy, so the movement of the molecules is higher, so more collisions between molecules happen. Because of the high kinetic energy, again, molecules collide and so the substrate for an enzyme, so what the enzyme works on, is more likely to find the enzyme. So our rate of reaction is speeding up. However, at a certain point, since enzymes are proteins, they can get denatured if the temperature is too high. Photosynthesis will actually decrease if temperature is too high because our essential enzymes are getting denatured, which just means that they're not useful to us anymore as the high temperature breaks down central bonds and the enzyme loses its shape. So whereas for temperature, it first goes up and then down again, if we look at light intensity as another limiting factor, we can see that it goes up with increasing light energy. So the rate of photosynthesis goes up and then reaches a plateau. So it remains at a certain level at some point. That happens because obviously we need light in order to activate or excite the electrons. So photosynthesis absorbs the light. The electrons are getting excited by that energy. But at some point, you know, we increase light energy, we can excite more electrons. But at some point, all of the photosynthetic pigments, so all of the chlorophyll is saturated. We just don't have any more chlorophyll to use. Even if we increase light intensity, there's just no more exciting electrons because all of our chlorophyll is saturated. That's where we reach that plateau. And we have the same graph, the same shape of increase and then plateau for carbon dioxide concentration. Because again, carbon dioxide is of course used for carbon fixation to create organic compounds. If we have more carbon dioxide around the plant that the plant can take in and then fixate into organic compounds, our rate of photosynthesis, so the rate of producing organic compounds, increases. But again, at some point, all of these enzymes which work on carbon fixation are saturated, just like the chlorophyll will be saturated at a certain light intensity. And so even if we increase then the concentration of CO2, we can't increase the rate of photosynthesis as we have reached the point of saturation. 